Today's message is going to be not only quite interesting and quite different, but I'm sure it's going to be quite controversial. The title of the message is Death, Burial, and Cremation. Because I have had many, many people ask me, even recently, uh, is it okay for believers to be cremated? So I'm going to share from the scripture my thoughts on this particular subject. Tough message. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> now the teaching is primarily in a question and answer form, at least the first half of the teaching anyway. And a lot of the questions and answers will be from the Jewish Book of Why, which I would highly recommend. It's, it's good, good reading. And much of the information in the teaching is based upon the Torah and the Tanakh, but also from a rabbinic commentary in the Talmud and in the Midrash. So we do need to use uh, discernment on what matches the scriptures and what does not. And in the teaching, again, we will be looking at the different viewpoints of being buried in the ground versus cremation. Now the timing is good because the teaching is also somewhat of an extension of the uh, teachings from the last two weeks on the resurrection of the Messiah, which we observed on Yom HaBikurim, the Feast of First Fruits. And also it connects with the season of those three special days in Judaism that we looked at last week, Yom HaShoah, which many call Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaZikaron, which is this Monday, and then, of course, Yom HaEitzma'ut is really Independence Day, which is this Tuesday. Now, let me first say this, that according to the rabbis, death is part of the Jewish life cycle along with birth, circumcision, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, marriage, and so on. And the Jewish Book of Wives states the following, just as there is a Jewish way of life, there is a Jewish way of death. Two basic considerations come into play when death strikes and the laws of death and mourning become applicable. One consideration involves the principle of what's called in Hebrew kavod hamet, which is the treatment of the deceased with reverence and respect. The other involves the principle of kavod hechai, which is concern for the welfare of the living or the family members, those who are close to the deceased. These two principles provide the basis for many of the laws and customs pertaining to death and mourning. So let's first take a closer look at subjects pertaining to death itself. Just again in the question and answer form. Number one, does Jewish law permit autopsies? In most cases, Jewish law opposes autopsies since mutilations of the body is forbidden. However, exceptions are permitted when homicide is involved, I suppose, to further the investigation. Question, does Jewish law permit organs from a deceased person to be donated to a living human being? Answer, freedom to do so is limited However, the wishes of the close relatives of the deceased is usually the deciding factor. Now, of course, these wishes can be legally documented by the person themselves before they die. Question, why is embalming forbidden in Jewish law when the Bible tells us in Genesis 50, verse 2 and verse 26, that Jacob and Joseph themselves were embalmed? Answer, in embalming, the blood is drained from the body and discarded, which is forbidden, since Judaism regards the blood as part of the body. And furthermore, we know the Torah tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. In addition, embalming was an Egyptian custom, and even though Jacob and Joseph were embalmed when they died in Egypt, it is not a prevalent practice amongst Jews. Question, 
Why does Judaism oppose public viewing of the body before the funeral services? Answer, viewing the body is an American custom. While some may regard it as showing respect for the dead, Judaism regards it as just the opposite, that it does not show respect for the deceased. Question, why are coffins used? Originally, the use of coffins was an Egyptian custom, not a Jewish one. The Bible in Genesis 52 states that Joseph was put in a coffin in Egypt. However, time changed over the centuries and it actually became a dishonor for a Jew to be buried without a coffin. And those who uh, practice Kabbalah, which is ancient Jewish mysticism, believe that it is better for the dead body to make direct contact with the earth, and therefore coffins in Israel are sometimes not used, but that is a very limited view. In Western countries, local laws usually demand the use of coffins, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. Now this is kind of a wild question. Why is earth from the Holy Land often placed in the coffin? How many of you have ever been to a Jewish funeral where some of the earth from the Holy Land is taken out of a jar and it's placed in the coffin? Here's the answer. According to Talmudic Judaism, Orthodox Judaism states that when the Messiah appears, there will be a resurrection from the dead and that those who lived a godly life will roll underground until they reach the Holy Land, no matter where they are buried. I told you we need to use some discernment here. Putting earth, therefore, from the Holy Land in the coffin supposedly helps to prepare them for that underground journey to the Holy Land where they will then be resurrected. And this should explain why many observant Jews wish to be buried directly in Israel rather than taking the subway system. <laughs> Question, why are Jewish men buried in simple shrouds? Shrouds in Hebrew, tachrichim? Answer, Rabbi Gamaliel 1800 years ago instituted this practice. All Jews were buried in the same garment, which was a single white linen garment, indicating that rich and poor are all alike before God. Yeshua actually fulfilled this custom, though we know his shroud was quite different. Furthermore, a kittel, which is a long robe, is often placed over the shroud, distinguishing that the person led a holy life. Question, why does Jewish law require that burials take place within 24 hours after death? For this one, let's go to the scriptures in the Torah. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. We're going to read verse 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. We know that Yeshua fulfilled this commandment of Torah, as Paul tells us in Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14, by hanging on the tree of sacrifice, becoming a curse for us and also buried within 24 hours. His body did not remain on the tree overnight. 
What's also interesting is that Jewish funerals are sometimes delayed due to unseen circumstance, unforeseen circumstances, but it's never delayed for more than three days, which somehow points to the resurrection of the Messiah. Now let's take a closer look at mourning. First of all, there's the ritual of sitting Shiva, which is an initial period of mourning for seven days, and the word Shiva actually means seven. And that goes back to Joseph mourning the death of his father Jacob for seven days, according to Genesis 50, verse 10. And that is also a time when a family is mourning and sitting Shiva. It's a time when other family and friends come to the house to the, of the deceased to pay condolences to the surviving members. Meals are brought to the house prepared by neighbors and friends, showing their compassion for the family's grief, and also memorial candles are lighted. And a special prayer, which is pronounced Kaddish, is recited. The Kaddish is an ancient poem which magnifies God even during a time of sorrow and grief and mourning, expressing the faith of the mourner even while being overwhelmed with stress. And this also goes back to the scripture. It's connected with the book of Job. Job who said, Though you slay me, yet will I praise you. And so I would like to chant the Kaddish for you, and we'll find this first PowerPoint, please. After those of you who are here, if you know it, you can chant it with me. Yit Kaddal, the Yit Kaddash, Shamei Rabbah, the Almad Yivrachute, the Yamlik Malchute, Say shalom bimromah, 
So all Israel stoned him, meaning Achan, and he went, oh, my Achan head. <laughs> and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones still there to this day. So Achan, with his sons and daughters, they were burned after being stoned. However, verse 26 says, over Achan, they piled up rocks, indicating that the bones themselves were not burned, but, but buried. Let's look at another example. These are obscure examples again. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 31. 1 Samuel 31, beginning with verse 8. And this was after Saul was defeated by the Philistines. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. Now when the inhabitants of Yabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night, took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan, and they came to Yabesh and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Yabesh, and fasted for seven days. That's also similar to Joseph mourning for his father Jacob for seven days. So it says here regarding Saul and his sons that their bodies were burned, the reason because their flesh was badly mutilated. The Israelites wanted to spare their bodies from further mutilation by the Philistines, and that's the reason why their flesh was burned, but their bones still were taken and buried. One more example, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And behold, a man of God, emphasis on a man of God, went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now Jeroboam, we know, was an idolatrous, evil king who installed priests in the high places to commit idolatry. Verse 2, Then he, meaning the man of God, cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. Now let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 23 as we see the fulfillment of this prophecy. 2 Kings chapter 23. And let's begin with verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made, both that altar and the high place he, meaning Josiah, broke down, and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain, and he sent and he took the bones of, out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words, that would be back in 1 Kings chapter 13. Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him, It is the tomb of the man of God, who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. 
And he, Josiah, said, Well, let him alone. Let no one move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who had come from Samaria. So what do we see here? Josiah, he burns the bones of the idolatrous Jewish priests, but he spares the bones of the righteous prophet, the man of God. Now I know again that these were obscure instances, but in each of these cases, those who were burned with fire, those who were cremated, were either the mutilated or they were ungodly, but never the righteous. Now here's some other general remarks. Only animals were offered by fire in the tabernacle and temple worship, never humans. The pagans caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, but God warned against this form of worship in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 31. Isaiah 43, verse 2 adds, When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. I will be with thee. And this he did with the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, who in a sense they were resurrected out of the fire. However, the scriptures seem to indicate that God takes no pleasure in seeing any of his children burned, whether in life or in death. Furthermore, cremation was never a part of ancient Judaism, but it was commonly practiced by the Romans, the Greeks, the Hindus, and other pagan nations. Let me also add this. The Hebrew word for burn is seraph, seraph. It means to set on fire, to utterly burn. And the Hebrew word for cremation is serei fatmet, which according to the Strong's Concordance, both these Hebrew phrases are connected with the term a fiery serpent. This would definitely connect with Revelation 20 verse 10, which says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet had also been thrown. Now again, this is just my opinion, but there's just no healthy connection in the Bible between the righteous and cremation, even if modern society, society says differently. So okay, Rabbi Jeremy, what does the Brit Hadashah have to say about this? What do the Gospels and the writings of Paul have to say on this subject? We're gonna look at four sets of scriptures in a row. Are we ready? Let's turn first to Matthew chapter 27. This first scripture is one we looked at two weeks ago when we were observing the Feast of First Fruits, you know, I'm going to read. Matthew 27, verse 50. And Yeshua cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Let's go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 23. But Yeshua answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified, shortly before his crucifixion and death. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 35.
But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow, meaning what you put into the ground, is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. Let's go to verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Let's look at one more, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Paul writes, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Yeshua. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the shofar of God. And the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. <coughs> the Brit Hadashah, as I see it, seems to indicate that we should be buried in the ground just like Yeshua was. Amen. And that we will be resurrected from the earth just like Yeshua was. Now, maybe the rapture will take place and we won't even have to be put into the ground. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hallelujah. Make no mistake about it. We are going to hear that shofar sound. We are going to hear the shout of an archangel. We are going to see Yeshua coming on the clouds of glory. And he is going to claim his bride. And again, I ask, who's looking forward to being at the wedding supper of the Lamb? Glory to God. <coughs> also, according to the scriptures, we should draw the following conclusions. The burning of bodies, whether living or dead, seems to be a practice of the ungodly. Fire has always represented God's judgment. Second Peter verse 3 tells us that the earth will be destroyed by fire. Those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be thrown into a lake of fire. Those who were resurrected were raised from the grave, as we see in the example of Yeshua and Eliezer, meaning Lazarus, and the holy people in Matthew chapter 27. Now, I've just kind of, this is a different kind of a message, I know it. I just laid it all out there, and I'm just presenting the Word of God. And let me also add that this is not a doctrinal issue that is necessary for salvation. Some of you may be planning on being cremated or perhaps had a loved one who was a believer and already was cremated. I am not speaking any condemnation here. But since so many people have been asking me about this subject, I thought it was time to present something about it. The scriptures seem to indicate that believers should not be cremated. But as the body as the body of Yeshua, we should be buried and resurrected as he was. I would add, if it's good enough for Yeshua, it should be good enough for us. Amen. 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 So I'd like you to listen to the words to this special song that the Lord gave me many years ago 
And then after that, we'll conclude by singing the song, He's Risen.
today believe that Yeshua is the resurrection and the life. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. 